Welcome to the first in a series of videos on Roland Barthes' Mythologies, which is a text from 1957. And this particular text is a frequently studied work in terms of literary theory, cultural studies, English, uh, different disciplines like that. It's not a really difficult text in terms of literary theory, but it has its challenges, and I thought it might be nice to do a series on it. Now, the text uh, has come out in different editions. I'm looking particularly at the 1972 English uh, translation. It doesn't have all the essays that Bart uh, wrote, and later editions uh, include some extra essays as well. But it has enough examples to, to get you started and to really get into the theory. So the book consists of two sections. Uh, the first section is really just examples. Okay, so lots of examples. There we go. And in this video, I'm just going to talk about the very first example, which is wrestling. And we have this corny sort of image here, uh, which is fitting because wrestling is all about corniness, as we will find out. Uh, in subsequent videos, I'll do at least a few more examples, and we'll see how many we actually cover. If you want to see lots, you can let me know in the comments. Uh, but the main thing is that as we go through the examples, we start to get a hint of the theory overall, so that when we get to the second part, the second part, which is really kind of Bart taking a step back and thinking about what all of this means, uh, we will be well prepared to understand where he's coming from. And what he's doing overall, we can already introduce a little bit, because he's really talking about semiotics. So semiotics is the study of signs, and he's going back especially to uh, a previous thinker, Ferdinand de Saussure, who wrote a lot about sign systems and how we should understand them. What's unique about Roland Barthes, uh, Barthes is that he applies these signs not just to language, but to culture, and that's the big breakthrough here, that uh, he's trying to say, well, we can not only look at how language functions, but we can look at how something in culture, something like wrestling, can act like a sign system, and we need to uh, interpret that particular sign system. So in the introduction to the 1970 uh, edition, he says, I had just read Saussure, uh, he says this in the preface, and he's very conscious of the fact that he's so influenced by this particular thinker. Now, in terms of his big picture, right at the start here, uh, even before we get to the theoretical part, we can see that what he's trying to do is he's trying to see how myth functions in relation to what he calls history and nature. So if we think of history, right, history, there we go, we have all kinds of events that happen, okay, so, uh, you know, the 1968 Paris um, student revolt, let's say. That's one event. He actually refers to that in the preface. Uh, lots of different events happen. Um, wrestling can be an event too. And what tends to happen is that these events are turned into myth somehow. Okay, so we create a myth out of these events. There we go. And then over time, uh, this myth starts to take up the whole field. So in other words, it seems like it's the only reality out there. It's as if everybody has to believe in it. And that makes this myth seem natural. Okay, so this is going to get a bit messy here. But this myth, uh, this myth, not meth, uh, this myth all of a sudden seems very natural because it's the only thing that we can think of. And uh, we can even call it universal. It's as if it's the only perspective out there. Now, for um, Roland Barthes, it's especially a certain social class that creates these myths, and that's the bourgeoisie. Uh, so the bourgeois myth is what rules supreme. And by bourgeois, he means kind of traditional, conventional society in this period. Uh, everything that a leftist like Barthes doesn't like, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, and he basically says that this myth is typically read or interpreted or presented to us through a sort of bourgeois lens, right? So if we kind of draw some spectacles here, it's as if we are looking through the same glasses all the time. 
And it's the job of the critic, which in this case would be Bart. So if we draw him over here, okay, so there he is. And he's kind of looking at all of this. It's his job to demystify the situation. Okay, so to demystify, I uh, better spell this correctly. I'm already misspelling this. <laughs> there we go. Demystify the situation. Uh, to kind of take the mythical element away and expose things as they really are. And as he's talking about striptease in one of his chapters, that kind of taking away of the clothing, uh, I suppose that that applies also to what he himself is doing. And one of the questions would be whether uh, any of this, this kind of revealing of what's really there has its own sexy quality, you could say. Now, Bart is aware that as he is looking at the myth, uh, it's possible that he himself creates new myths, right? Do we ever really escape this notion of myth? And that raises the question, well, what is his mythology? Does he have his own mythology? Does he have his own sign system that we, from our vantage point, then need to understand? And in fact, that's why we can also draw ourselves, right? This would be the reader of Bart. <laughs> there you go looking at Bart, uh, we come with our own spectacles. And as you can start to see, this really complicates the picture. But Bart does raise this in his preface, this problem of what is his own mythology? Is he totally neutral? Can you ever escape myth? Uh, these are some of the questions that he is asking right from the start. So uh, let's have a look at wrestling then. We'll just sample one chapter here just to get us into the text a little bit. And as I mentioned, if you want to have lots of examples uh, covered, that's totally fine. You can let me know. So what is wrestling? Um, well, the first thing we can say about it is that it's a spectacle. Okay, so it's a spectacle. It's not a sport, he says. Uh, it's very dramatic, but the outcome is not as important as the process. It's much more like a play. We enjoy the action, we follow it, we watch it, uh, but we don't worry too much about who wins, in part because the whole, whole context is somewhat artificial and possibly fixed anyways. The next thing that's important is that he talks here about what kind of sign that is, and this is. And he says that in wrestling, signs are always clear, okay? So as you read each chapter, before you get to the theoretical part, I would encourage you to kind of try to figure out what is the theory about science in this chapter. So don't get sucked into just the topic, whether it's margarine or cars or <laughs> uh, steak and, and, and stuff like that. Try to figure out what is he actually saying about the way in which signs are operating here. And when it comes to wrestling, he says uh, there is a kind of pure and full signification. In other words, every sign is super obvious in what it means. Uh, he writes at one point, the gesture of the vanquished wrestler, right? So the wrestler who's on, on the mat, you might say, who, who's being beaten, signifying to the world a defeat, which far from disguising, he emphasizes and holds like a pause in music corresponds to the mask of antiquity meant to signify the tragic mode of the spectacle. So in ancient times, they would they would have these masks on uh, to signify, right, if they were laughing or crying. Uh, and it was very obvious. In the same way here, the signs are super, super clear. You're not going to be mistaken about what a particular move in wrestling or a particular pose represents. We also see that we have these very clear types of characters. And his example here is of Thoven, <laughs> the disgusting man, the bastard, who is cruel and unpredictable. Uh, and we, we kind of hate him, uh, but we also understand his sense of justice and the way he's trying to survive in a, in a certain kind of world. Uh, so it's a complicated picture here, but it's nevertheless a type. And if you've watched a little bit of wrestling, you can probably see other types as well, right? Like the pretty boy, and uh, there's lots of other ones. But the main point here is that these types of characters are very easy to read. You know what you're dealing with. We can also say that there are very clear narrative patterns. So very clear narrative patterns. The stories are predictable. 
and yet we enjoy watching them anyways. Uh, so commonly we have suffering, defeat, and justice, okay? And the suffering has this classical sense of spectacle, uh, which also creates a sort of heroism, because even if you are a wrestler who is defeated, there's still heroism in that to some extent. The justice part, I think, is really quite fascinating here, because this is not your traditional justice. And one of the things that you'll recognize as you go through the book is that Roland Barthes, being quite the leftist, hates traditional institutions, which of course means that he's also going to hate or distrust the traditional justice system, right? And maybe that's where he kind of admires wrestling a little bit, because very rarely is a fight ever truly fair. So we're dealing with a kind of extrajudicial way of understanding the world, uh, which has its own its own kind of logic and its own kind of appeal. Another thing that's that's predictable is that we have very symbolic moves. Okay, so very symbolic moves when it comes to wrestling. Uh, he talks about the hold, the forearm, forearm smash, and other moves. Uh, these things are predictable, and they have their symbolism, their meaning. So if we sum all of this up, what we can say is that on the one hand, we have a great deal of formalism. Formalism. All of these things follow a predictable form and a pattern. But there is still something genuine in wrestling as well. And if you read between the lines in the chapter, you see that Bart is trying to get at that. that wrestling is this weird paradox where on the one hand, um, it's conventional, it's artificial, it's fake, right? But you get the sense that it's not entirely bourgeois in the se in the way that other things are. Um, it's there, there's still the sense of rebellion and unruliness and chaos, which I think Bart seems to secretly admire a little bit. So here, right away in the book, you start to get this tension uh, somewhat where. We, we think, well, is this bourgeois? Is it not? Does Roland Barthes like it? <laughs> uh, and as you go on, right away, the next chapter, he talk, starts talking about uh, representation of Romanness in Hollywood. There, he talks about signs that, he, that are artificial, but are not genuine. So what makes a sign seem more genuine and something that we can admire? And what makes something artificial and hypocritical? Is there a standard for that? How, how do we apply that to science? That's a question that I'm not sure Bart, Bart always um, raises or even answers, because that gets to the heart of who he is, right? What does he think is hypocritical? Uh, and that's really one of the, the, the issues that this book struggles with. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a good sense of the first chapter, the, the introduction, uh, and we'll go on with our series and talk some more about um, other examples and the theory.